Heart failure is a truly complicated syndrome with symptoms and sequelae affecting and being affected by maybe every organ system in the body. So the purpose of this video is to give a conceptual framework for the major things that happen in response to an impairment and the ability of the left ventricle to contract. Here we're not going to go into the long-term remodeling that goes on. So the model we're going to be thinking about is more of an acute heart failure situation. For example, if some distal segment of the left anterior descending coronary artery were suddenly occluded, a part of the left ventricular free wall would become ischemic, resulting in oxygen de deprivation, resulting in an inability to generate ATP to meet the demands of the muscle, resulting in an overall reduction in pumping capacity. But even though we're going to be thinking about an acute event, the thinking that goes into understanding this acute event will translate to chronic conditions, and we'll see that in a minute. What we want to understand are the major compensatory responses to diminished contractility of the left ventricle. We're going to start out by thinking in terms of this very simple diagram. Looks simple, but maybe it's deceptively simple. So um, here we're looking at the cardiovascular circuit where the left ventricle pumps blood to the systemic circulation and the right ventricle pumps blood to the lung. So I labeled this diagram with some reasonable pressures in black. On the systemic side, 100 millimeters of mercury, mean arterial pressure, mean venous pressure of around four. Um, that four, by the way, represents the preload to the right ventricle. The pulmonary pressures are 15 millimeters of mercury arterial and five millimeters of mercury venous. Now, to be clear, these numbers are not written in stone. These are meant to represent reasonable numbers uh, that represent a normal baseline physiological state. Okay, so now, What's happening in red? In red, I'm indicating an example of what might happen if the left ventricular pumping is impaired. So you see that some of these pressures change. Some go up a little bit, some go up more, and some don't necessarily change. It's important to understand that when the left ventricle fails, the initial effect on pressure is greatest in the pulmonary side. And so the key to understanding that um, is that the failing left ventricle requires an increase in preload to maintain cardiac output. When the pump fails, pressure and volume will build up on the inlet, and that's what's happening here. So I've made a, an, an assumption, just to keep things simple here, that the preload on the left ventricle builds up enough to maintain the same afterload and resting cardiac output as you had before the insult. So the same 100 millimeters of mercury on the systemic arterial side. So in reality, the patient might be worse off than that, but let's just keep things simple to wrap our heads around uh, this stuff here. Okay. So now, how did I write down these specific numbers? Well, first off, I assume that since the LV is failing, it needs a nice big increase in preload to keep up pumping. 20 millimeters of mercury venous pressure, approximately, you'll get that same um, pressure in end diastole. It's much higher than normal, um, but it's a totally reasonable number for heart failure. Could even be worse than that, or higher. So next I assume that the pulmonary circuit is unchanged. So if the output of the right ventricle is unchanged and the resistance of the pulmonary circulation is unchanged, then the pressure drop before and after the insult should be the same. 10 millimeters of mercury before, 10 millimeters of mercury after. So like it says here, mean pulmonary arterial pressure increases as much as the pulmonary venous pressure, at least in this specific example. So next, what does that mean for the right ventricle? Well, the afterload has now been doubled on the, to the right ventricle. So how can the otherwise unaffected right ventricle maintain its output in the face of doubling of its afterload? So we can make the preload in the right ventricle higher. And that's exactly what would happen. If you suddenly were to increase afterload, transiently the pressure at the inlet would build up until the increased preload compensates wholly or partly for the increased afterload. So here I've again made the simplifying assumption um, that the compensation is, is perfect. The doubling of the preload compensates exactly for a doubling of the afterload. Okay, so now take a step back and, and look at the overall diagram. The left side is failing, the left ventricle. So where do the pressures increase the most? In the pulmonary side. They'll increase a little on the systemic venous side as well, but the volume and the pressure buildup is greatest on the pulmonary side. To get a bit of a deeper understanding, let's draw some pressure volume loops. 
I know you all love pressure volume lips just as much as I do, so let's get to it. So remember the normal LV pressure volume relationship illustrated here. So again, this is just an example to show a reasonable baseline state. Um, we have this curve down here, which tells us what is happening during filling. Okay, there's a passive pressure increase in diastole, um, which is what's happening here in this part of the pressure volume loop. Then during isovolemic contraction, pressure goes up. Then we have ejection, and then we have relaxation. So this um, end diastolic, sorry, end systolic pressure volume relationship is a reflection of the Frank Starling relationship. So the higher the filling, the greater the pressure that can be generated. So when the when the left ventricle fills, that relationship is changed, like so. So this part of this diagram is where we're indicating the, the, the left heart failure, okay, the decrease in contractility. Right, so now I drew the original pressure volume loop with a systolic pressure of, of about 120. Um, the venous pressure is equivalent to the pressure sort of near the end of diastole. The end diastolic pressure might be a little higher than the average venous pressure because of the extra kick supplied by uh, atrial contraction. So the original venous pressure of about five is, is right here on the original pressure volume loop. For the failing circumstance, the PV loop needs to be shifted to the right to achieve something like the same systolic pressure that you had before the failure, right? So to do that, you can see on this graph that we need to increase venous pressure to around 20. Now we can draw the same sorts of curves for the right ventricle and they have the same sort of shape, but in the case of the right ventricle, the end systolic pressure volume relationship is not changed by the left ventricle failing but we still have to shift things to the right because now the right ventricle has to work against this big afterload, right? Which is coming because the left side is failing. So the afterload on the right side caused by the increase in preload to the left ventricle. Okay. So you might want to pause the video, look at these diagrams, make sure you understand them. There's, there's, there's a lot here. Okay. So, so it, it, there's a couple of interesting things that emerge from these plots immediately. So first you might notice that um, because of the increase in preload, the failing LV is doing a little bit less work than the normal state. Um, remember the pressure volume loop area is the stroke work, okay? And the pressure volume loop area in failure is a little bit less than it, than it was in the normal case. So where is that work gone? Well, look, the right ventricle is doing more stroke work, more pressure volume area. So the LV does less work, and the right ventricle picks up the slack. The other more obvious thing is, of course, this dilation that happens with ejection fraction going down in both chambers. So reduced ejection fraction is a feature of heart failure. More specifically, it's a feature of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, also known as HEF, REF, HF, REF for heart failure, reduced ejection fraction. The astute listener might be thinking at this point, if the volumes in parts of the body's vasculature are increasing because of volume increases associated with these pressure increases, shouldn't there be a volume decrease someplace else? And the answer is actually yes and no. So to get to, to, to a complete answer to that question, let's look at this diagram. So if you've watched the video on pressure regulation, you've seen this before. Um, and in fact, yes, indeed, if volume and pressure were to build up on the inlet side of the left ventricle acutely, which would happen following an insult to the left ventricle, the pressure and volume on the outlet side, the aorta, would drop, it would go down. But then there are a series of acute and chronic compensatory things that would happen as a result. Most importantly, acutely, the barrel reflex would cause an increase in venous vasoconstriction, effectively allowing the venous pressure to stay elevated while allowing volume to shift back to the arterial side. So remember, venous constriction is in many ways equivalent to an increase in, in total blood volume. On a more chronic time scale in heart failure, both the sympathetic and the renin angiotensin aldosterone systems are activated leading to an increase in circulating blood volume. So both of these effects contribute to the increase in um, preload on, on the LV side in, in heart failure. So the compensations you see here contribute to the big picture changes that you see here. 
in, in this diagram. So again, take a moment to, to, to really study these diagrams and, and, and do your best to understand the, the compensatory changes that, that they're illustrating. And thank you very much for listening.